study with him. Maybe he can tell you a little bit about himself. He's a doctor of clinical psychology. He's a child therapist. He has vast experience in the uh, fields of education and mental health. Um, he's been working with African American, he knows about African American boys and their plight in the educational system. He deals with their parents. Um, he diagnoses um, children. He, um, can talk to you about, if, I don't know if any of you have ever been diagnosed with ADHD, or if you were placed in special education, perhaps, uh, as, a, as a child, and if you had, it shouldn't be anything you shouldn't be embarrassed of. Um, so he does that work on a daily basis when he's not traveling the country uh, talking about African empowerment and how we can uplift our communities and uplift ourselves to be able to strengthen the community. So that's a little bit about him. Um, his, as I mentioned, he has lots of friends and lots of detractors as well. Uh, some people who don't appreciate his uh, bluntness, his forthrightness, and his standing absolute on his beliefs and his principles. Um, bless you. Bless you. Thank you. But that's okay. I want y'all to be just as resolute and just as sound or whatever it is you believe in. So I want you to really take note uh, of him. Um, and so with that, these are our awesome Many of them are involved in our social justice initiative here on campus, creating advocates for change, whatever that looks like or whatever that is for them. I encourage them, whatever, if they want to be PTA president, take that, take it. Mm -hmm. Be the best PTA president. Change for good looks like many different things in our community. We always think like that lofty, I'm going to change the world. Changing the world starts with wherever you are. Local, right? If your water is brown and dirty, change that. That's significant. Again, your PTA is shoddy, change that. So that's what we're trying to create. Advocates who change the world for the better. This is what you're doing in right. your own way. Right. So yeah, y'all feel free. You wanna, let, you wanna say a couple words to them and then let them talk to you. Sure, that's if we could, have okay. everyone go around and give me yeah, your name, your year, and your major. Princess. <laughs> Hey, I'm Chantel Scott. Um, my major is business management, and I'm a junior. In hometown, I'm sorry. Gary, Indiana. Gary, Indiana. All right. Hi, I'm Chantier Davis. I am a freshman here. Um, my major is psychology, oh. and, <laughs> and um, I'm from here in Little Rock. Little Rock. My name's Antonisha Murray. I'm from East St. Louis, Illinois. I'm a freshman majoring in English. All right. My name is Marco James Griffin. I'm a double major in computer science and business administration with an accounting emphasis. And I'm also from Chicago, Illinois. Cal City, South Burns, to be exact, with all the other cities. I'm Tay Jamie. I'm a graduating senior and I'm a criminal justice major. All right. I'm Claudette Spencer. I'm a sophomore here majoring in political science. My double major. I'm Sean Gale from Louisiana, and I major in elementary education. And I'm uh, affiliated with the Long Star RBG. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. He's a awesome rapper, too. Oh, man. <laughs> okay, okay. My name is Hakeem Wortham. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. I major in psychology, and I'm a senior. All right, another site. Okay. I'm Rakeem Wortham from Chicago, Illinois. I'm a senior major in political science. Ali Zah. All right. My name is Adonis Fitzpatrick. I'm from Chicago, and I'm a biology major. Ooh. Strong. Science. My name is John Wiz. I'm a psychology major from Kansas City, Missouri. All right, KC. I'm Justin Watson. I'm a business major from Chicago. Another shout out to Oh, man, I spend more time in Chicago than almost any other city in the country. So it's kind of where I began my quote unquote international career was uh, in Chicago. So it's a very special place uh, for me there. Before we go any further, I want to give you all my number in case I ever need to be of any assistance to any of you, especially my psych majors and my poli sci, since those were my majors. Yeah. Uh, 215, and I'll say it three times 215. 989-9858. Again, that's 215-989-9858. One more time, what y'all got? We got it. Okay. My email address is my name at Yahoo. So it's D-R for Dr. U-M-A-R Johnson. J-O-H-N-S-O-N. One word, D-R-U-M-A-R Johnson. J-O-H-N-S-O-N at yahoo.com because the number may be changing in a couple weeks so at least you still have my email okay for my psych majors you need to get your school psychologist certification also if you are graduating from philander with at least a three five or greater
for my psych majors, then I would encourage you to apply straight for a doctoral program. You don't need a master's degree. That goes for all of you. You don't need a master's degree, period, to get into any doctoral program. Master's degrees are for folks who either not committed to doing a four or five years straight up or who don't have the GPA to do the four or five years straight up, okay? But if you got the GPA, why fool with a master's? If you can get a doctorate in four, why are you playing with a master's in two? Get it all done. But you got to have the grades to go straight. If you don't have the grades, you got to get your master's to prove you can handle the doctorate work. So get the GPA and go straight. For all of you, don't take no time off. If you know you need that master's, and most of you do, go straight. You take time off, you're going to end up with babies and bills. Go now. True. Go broke so you know you're there. Once you get that car, you get that apartment, you're going to start losing your desire to finish those degrees. And that's when two years becomes 20 years. You want to get everything done and out the way by the time you're 25 to 28. So the only two questions left for you is where you're going to buy your first house and who you're going to marry. That should be it. Okay. Well, I'm Big Papa, y'all know that. But anyhow, the only two questions you should be left with is where you're going to live and who you're going to marry. Okay? The reason why some of us continued our education well into our 40s is because we wasn't as focused. When I came out of undergrad and got my master's as a school psychologist, I go back to Philadelphia. I was working. I was making pretty good money. I always knew I wanted my doctorate, but I took my eyes off the prize. Don't take your eyes off the prize because once you get your life rolling, you don't want to stop and go back to school. Even if it's a night program like mine's was, it still inconveniences you. Now you got children. You got other stuff you want to do. Go straight through. The best way to do college is straight through with no bricks. Okay? Also, there's a lot of free money out there for grad school. Y'all black. Okay? So when you apply to graduate schools, of course, you want to hit up all the HBCUs, but you know at the HBCUs, you're not the minority. The white kids are, which means it ain't as much scholarships for us as it is for them because we're the majority because these are our schools, right? So that means when you apply to grad school, after you apply to the HBCUs, make sure you apply to some white schools too. Okay? including white schools in the middle of nowhere with no black kids. Why? Because if you apply to a white school in the middle of nowhere with no black kids, the chances of you getting in and getting your whole education paid for go up exponentially. Okay? Follow the money. Follow the money. Okay? You guys already been to the HBCU. You got the experience. I'm glad you did because I didn't. It's one of my regrets. I got accepted to Morehouse but couldn't afford it, so I stayed back in Pennsylvania. I got that experience. So if y'all got to go white now, you can go white now. Now, if you can stay black, you stay black. Okay? Oh, well, y'all better stay black. But anyhow, <laughs> if you can stay at the HBCU for grad school, do it. But if you get in a white school that's knocking on the door saying, hey, come out here to the middle of we hate black people in Mississippi, and we're going to pay your whole education, then guess what? You're going to go get you a burner, you're going to go to we hate black people in Mississippi. Because it's free. Because we're going to keep your loan debt down. It's all about keeping the loan debt down. The other thing I need to think about what? You're going to roll your degree over into as far as entrepreneurship goes because the days of waiting for a job is over. That's over. So what you want to do is determine how you want to use your career, excuse me, use your degree to spurn a career. So for me, being a school psychologist, fed naturally into my public speaking it, it fed naturally into me doing trainings for colleges and trainings for teachers across the country and even going to other countries and doing trainings there. So that's my entrepreneurship. How am I going to flip this? For my political science majors, I was also poli sci. I double majored with psychology. So you have to decide what you want to do with that political science. Do you want to get your doctorate and teach it? Do you want to go on to law school? Okay, I would definitely encourage you to go to law school. And if you do go to law school, make sure you specialize in educational law. You can specialize in other stuff, but make sure you specialize in educational law. Why? <clears throat> because educational attorneys make a lot of money, and there's very few black ones. Whenever a child is misdiagnosed as retarded, and we find out he was never retarded, now the mom has to sue for psychological damages and educational damages, I normally have to send him to a white lawyer, a white educational attorney because there's very few black educational attorneys. You'll make a lot of money, the cases are easy to win, and you'll be making a lot of difference, okay? Educational law and school psychology are two careers that they don't tell black folks about, so I'm telling y'all about them now. 
My psych majors, get that school psych cert. Only the school psychologists can test for special ed disabilities. Even if you get your doctorate and you get licensed as a psychologist, if you're not certified to test in the schools, you're missing out on making a big difference and you're missing out on making some big money. Get that cert, okay? And for those of you who want to be lawyers, get that ed law cert and then you get back in contact with me and I'm gonna make you rich because I'm gonna teach you how to win all the cases. Easy. Easy. Now it's your time. You can ask me anything you want. It ain't got to be about education. It can be about a rumor you heard. Because there's a lot of those going around. Whatever you want to ask Dr. Rudolph. Wait a minute, y'all twins. Yep. It just hit me. Okay? Hold on. Man, it just hit me. My brother. Yes, sir. Um, well, I had a question. All right, she, you were oh, go ahead, I, I was just being funny, but I do have a question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, in this report from News One, Mm -hmm. It says mm -hmm. that <coughs> you argued single black mothers psychologically castrate their sons, and also it says he claims that light skinned people aren't really black. <laughs> okay, can you give me the quote where I claim that light skinned people aren't really black? And I've never said that. This is just a news one article, so I'm just you know trying to hear your perspective on what they say. I'm gonna turn that into a lesson for y'all. <laughs> because all y'all in social justice. Mm -hmm. And one thing you're going to have to get used to is people outright lying, people changing your words, people misrepresenting what you say, and taking your concepts out of context. That's the first time I heard that. I never heard that anyone ever said, I said, light skinned people are not really black. When as a pan Africanist, we teach not only are light skinned people black, mm -hmm. but we come in every shade. But even Africans who have a white parent, are still black. You understand? So if you have a white mother or a white father, you still belong to us because the African DNA predominates. Yes. Whatever we mix with becomes us. So just like I would invite a so-called biracial and so-called biracial sister, and I say so-called because there's no such thing as biracial. It's a social construct. Whatever, it's a social construct. Whatever we mix with, we take over. So ain't no half black. You understand? So for somebody to say light skin, and my father light skin, and my nieces are light skin, and my grandma a light skin, if half my family walked in this door, y'all think they was probably biracial. So that was a lie right there. I never heard that before, but I'm glad you brought that up. As far as mothers psychologically castrating their sons, that's true. But it's not only mothers. A father can psychologically castrate his son. See, that's where they took what I said out of context and make it look like I'm saying black mothers are responsible for the effeminization. Black fathers are also responsible for the effeminate. You understand? So anybody can psychologically castrate a child. And what I was referring to is how for a lot of black boys, I find that they struggle with their manhood because they were so verbally abused at home. So for example, let's say you grew up and you're not very athletic. And your father's constantly pushing you to be a football player, basketball player. You just don't want to do it or you're not good at it. By him constantly criticizing and condemning you, you can start questioning your own ability to live as a man. Mm. And that's a form of feminization. <clears throat> in no way, shape, or form did I ever say that mothers are exclusively responsible for that. And I cannot believe they said I said light skinned people ain't black. Mm. Damn. <laughs> that's why I said that's why I I never heard that. I never heard that. I never heard that. Wow. <laughs> but I'm gonna tell y'all something else. <clears throat> as y'all work in the community now and after graduation. One of the most important things you can do is create your own vehicle of information and journalism so you can educate the community yourself about what you're about. Because if you don't have your own newsletter, your own website, your own monthly email, then you are at the mercy of the negative forces in the media, black or white. You understand? So because I do regular live streams on Facebook and because I speak around the world so much, People can hear directly from me. But as I get older and I won't be as mobile, I will have to create a vehicle to talk directly to the people. Otherwise, people will be at the mercy of the lies that are put out about me. And that's why the Honorable Marcus Garvey said that propaganda has destroyed more people than warfare. Because what is propaganda? It is war through words, misinformation. And America is master of propaganda. This government spends over a half billion dollars a year lying about people in order to achieve its political ends. 
They lied about the Panthers. They lied about Garvey. They lied about Keene. They lied about Malcolm and Mega. They lied about H. Rep. Bram and Stokely. They lied about Mr. Muhammad. It's what they do. So if you don't put out your own newspaper, your own, that's why the Nation of Islam has the final call. That's why the Black Panther Party has the Black Panther. That's why Marcus Garvey had the Negro world, because you got to control your narrative. You don't want to leave it up to Don Lemon and Wolf Blitzer. Mm. <laughs> Princess. I know you deal with a lot of scrutiny of Clue and when, mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to like rumors of just making, you know, just being you. Mm -hmm. I know your character is under attack a lot of times, but how do you deal so far with that pressure? Because that would, that would drive me crazy. Hanging up in my house is a little sign that I bought from one of the African shops. I think I bought it in Memphis at one of the lectures. And it said, whenever I get tired, I think about what Harriet Tubman did for a living. Mm -hmm. And whenever I get weary, it says, whenever I get tired, I think about what Harriet Tubman did for a living, day in and day out. Yesterday, we celebrated Frederick Douglass's 200th uh, Earth Day, who's a kinsman of mine, blood relative, day in and day out. Marcus Garvey, day in and day out. We come from ancestors who put those boots on and didn't take them off until they got into the casket. So if they could go through that in the 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, even the 16th and 17th century, who am I to complain only 18 years into the 21st century? You see? So I think of those who came before me and I keep on going. Never judge yourself by the people around you. Judge yourself by the great ones who came before you. If I judge myself by the coons on YouTube, I'm already the greatest. I can't judge myself by them because that's a low standard. I got to go to people who I know I don't stack up next to. You understand? So I got to compare myself to Garvey. I got a long way to go. Malcolm, I got a long way to go. Mega Evers, I got a long way to go. Even if I go way back, Sojourner Truth, if I go back to uh, Henry Holland Garnett, Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, I got a long way to go. That's what keeps me motivated because I say, what are they thinking about me up top from heaven? What are the ancestors saying? And that's what keeps me motivated. It ain't easy though. Sometimes you got to stop. Sometimes you got to cry. Sometimes you need to hug. But you get back in the race. Um, I have one more question because sure. I have to leave it mm -hmm, up to the mm -hmm. student. Uh, but my question is about your Breakfast Club interview because I watched it. Which and I one? Thought it was really interesting. Where you one, were talking two, or three. about <laughs> you were talking about a student like uh, visiting China. Yes. And like what it was like to be African American mm -hmm. and ex you know in in the in the public arena there mm -hmm. and how racism was just so alive and vibrant. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that experience was like? Yes. I don't know if everyone heard it. In fact, I just came back from Japan and China again three weeks ago. What bothers me about the black experience in Japan, excuse me, let me take it back, the black experience in China. Your experience in Japan is different from China, even though they're neighbors, because Japan is an ally of the United States. So they treat African Americans with a much greater level of respect. The racism is still there, but it's a more comfortable living. China, totally different. In China, they look down upon you. In China, they're not used to seeing black people, so they want they will run up to you and ask to take a picture with you. If you ever go to China, be prepared for Chinese people to run up to you all day long, like you're a celebrity, and ask you to take pictures. And you may say yes, you may say no. I've taken a couple, but now I'm starting not to take them because I had to recognize they're not taking a picture of you as a successful black man, they're taking mm -hmm. a picture of you like you're their pet monkey. You understand? I had one sister, she was in a cab with her child. And guess what? The cab driver turned around and took a picture of her baby without her permission. And so she had to smack the camera out of his hand because they will even snap you without your permission. They have that mindset that the white man has told the world about black people that we're docile and you can treat us any kind of way that you want. And the most disheartening thing about the black experience in China is there's no civil rights laws. Mm. Which means what? Which means you can read a newspaper in China that says, we're hiring for this, but no black people need to apply. Mm -hmm. You can go to buy a house and they'll say no black people allowed to live here. There's nightclubs where black people can't go and they're very upfront with it. Like you'll be, it's a culture shock to see how black people get treated in China. Because they don't practice the clandestine, a strategic, manipulative, deceptive racism of the white man in Arkansas. They're out front with it. Okay, and the sad thing about that is in Africa, Chinese people are treated with the privilege that you don't find nowhere else in the world. They're buying up South Africa right now, buying up Jamaica. They're buying up all throughout Africa. So we roll out the red carpet for Chinese. Mm -hmm. 
So when they come to Africa, they get treated like kings and queens. But when we go to China, we get treated like slaves. And it's the double standard that exists around the world. And it's a shame that African countries let them treat us like that when they treat them so well when they come to Africa. It's, it's, it's a shame. It's an absolute shame. And they're so aggressive with controlling black immigration in China that when you come to China and they stamp your visa and they put it in a computer like every country do, let's say you're only supposed to be in China for two weeks. That 15th day, they will come and find you. They will raid the homes of people who you've been associating with in the middle of the night and drag you to the airport to send your ass back to Arkansas. They don't want black folks in China any longer than you absolutely have to stay. Mm. But there's a lot of black people over there because there's a lot of jobs. China is the Walmart of the world. You want it, they make it. Okay, you want Air Jordans? They'll make them too. Now the swoosh might be upside down, <laughs> but you can get them. Okay, a lot of you not. Bootlegging is major in China, and they don't hide it. You know, if you're in New York, you got to go down to 125th and then pop the trunk and get those fake Tims. Not in China. They sell them right out in the open. That's why America is so upset with them because they do not respect capitalism. Remember, they're communists. So they sell all the knockoff stuff. All of it. And because it's so much manufacturing there, there's so many jobs. So people go from all over the world because you can... They say in China, if you don't have a job in China, it's because you don't want to work. That's how much manufacturing, but it's also costing the environment because you can't see the sun in China. It's so much pollution from the factories that it's literally a cloud every day, even if it's sunny outside. Oh, and one other thing. This was a joke that some of the brothers and sisters told me while I was there. They said, people talk about us like a watermelon and chicken. They said, black, they said, Chinese are the real Negroes. They said, Chinese people in love with watermelon and fried chicken. They not lying. They eat fried chicken all day long. They will pop the, and they will pull the truck over the middle of the day, pull out some watermelons, Get a machete, start eating watermelon right on the side of the road with chicken in one hand, watermelon in the next. <laughs> straight China, baby, straight China. Yes, sir. Uh, well, it's like a two-part question. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you asked, you told us we can ask you about uh, scandals and sure, 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 sure. Heard. Well, I just called in that um, you're not you're not opening a school anymore. Who told you that? I didn't, <laughs> I, mean, I didn't say anything. I feel like I was guilty. Who told but, you that? Uh, I just heard that, and I was just trying to get. Where did you hear it from? Here at the on campus. Okay. So I just was like, you know, I don't. I, I told them that you were opening the school, and they were like, No, you're gonna open it. Oh and yes, you got, I am. And you that's got your, that one here uh, today. And they said that you got your license um, suspended or taken away. Also from you. incorrect. <laughs> what happened was okay in psychology. Remember how I said if you're a psych major, you want to get your certification as a school psychologist, mm -hmm. which I have, right? Mm -hmm. The certification as a school psychologist, which gives you the professional privilege to evaluate for special education disabilities, is not the same as a license. I never pursued my license because I really didn't need it because the certification gives me the right to do everything I need to do because I specialize in children, not adults. That's why I didn't get the license because I really don't need it. Somebody wrote a complaint to the Pennsylvania State Board of Psychology, okay? alleging that I was practicing as a licensed psychologist without being one. So they brought me before the board under the charge that I was practicing as a licensed psychologist without being one. I asked for the evidence, and the evidence was two clips from the Breakfast Club interviews, right? In Pennsylvania, a certified school psychologist employed by a public school can practice privately. That's the law. So the hearing should have never even took place because legally I can do that, although I don't practice privately. All of my work is in the school setting. So the whole case was bogus, and what made it even more bogus is they wouldn't even tell me who it was who made the complaint. So now not only are you charging me with something with no evidence, breakfast club interview, and you won't even tell me who did it. So I believe that the only reason why they drug me up to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, is because they don't agree with my political views. You understand? My social beliefs. They don't agree with me saying that black men, they got no business marrying outside the race. They got a problem with me educating black parents about special ed. They got a problem with me telling black parents don't put your kids on Ritalin and Adderall and Concerted because of nothing but crack. Yeah. That's the real reason they brought me up there. You understand? So where are we now? They were supposed to give me their decision on the 8th, 30 days. The hearing was on January 8th. February 8th, I was supposed to get the decision. I ain't got it yet. 
So I think what they're doing is just looking for anything they can find and make their case stronger. What do I think they're going to do? I think they're going to ban me from getting my license. I think they're going to fine me the $10,000, and I think they're going to put some sort of disciplinary mark against my school psychologist certification. At the end of the day, is it really going to matter for me? Uh-uh. Because I knew when I became a school psychologist that my days were numbered because of who I am and what I represent. All of you will pay a price. You better realize that you will have to sacrifice something. Marcus Garvey had to give up being in America. They kicked him out. Dr. King, they took his life. Malcolm, they took his life. Booker T died at 53. You will sacrifice something. Frederick Douglass, no freedom. Harriet Tubman, no free time. You will have to sacrifice something. And if you're not willing to sacrifice something, then call yourself an activist. Because this work right here is nothing fun about it. You have to do this because your heart is in it. You got to do it because your heart is in it. And you have to know right now while you're still at this college whether or not you are sincerely committed to your people's freedom. Because if you are not, the white man will find the chink in your armor and he will use it to turn you into a coon. Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton never grew up thinking they would betray black people. They thought they was true. They didn't realize they weren't until the white man gave them a decision that they had to make. You understand? So you got to make sure your heart is pure going into this. Because they will offer you money. They will threaten your children, threaten your job. They're serious about this. Because leadership is critical to black elevation. Leadership is critical to the elevation of any people. So anybody who stands up as a leader or an organizer, they waiting to come and get you. I'm glad, I'm glad you said something about leadership. Now, when, now, this is the second part of the question. Uh -huh. Now, when it comes to leadership, when it, we have black men and black women, mm -hmm. there seems to be, I've been having a lot of debates lately on campus, and um, there's a lot of women, there's a lot of women that feel like women are, you know, marginalized way more and held back way more than any, uh, any other demographics in this country. Mm -hmm. And, like, they say that we don't, I tell them all the time as a whole, black people are struggling together. But as for like, I feel like a division, like it's a big division between black men and black women. And like a lot of black women, like they empower themselves and they, you know, they go off and then they, they really get that mindset. We don't need you anymore, you know, and they, and I'm, I'm just trying to get your thoughts on that. Okay. The black woman is the only woman in America who out educates and out earns her mate. Yeah. Most of the women in this room will make more money than the men in this room. Most of the women in this room will have a slightly more comfortable life than the men in this room. But they will still suffer the racism. Mm -hmm. They will still suffer the racism. And this is why we have to fight together because at the end of the day, we all we got is each other. And the mm -hmm. black man has to recognize the black woman and his enemy. And the black woman got to recognize the black man and her enemy. The reason black women feel some type of way about black men is because we're not able to do for them what everyone else's man can do for them. When a black woman looks and see what the Chinese man could do for the Chinese woman and what the Anglo-Saxon could do for the Anglo-Saxon female and what the Arab can do for his woman, and then she look at us and say, well, what the hell is y'all problem? And that's why we have to politically educate them about systematic racism against black males because it's a reason why they out-educate and out-earn us, and that is because we have always been considered public enemy number one. America has always done whatever she could to not empower the black male to render us useless and powerless so that we can always be controlled. And so now what they're doing under the Trump administration with the wave of feminism that's taking place is they're looking for black women who are willing to co-sign their message about black men that we are no good. And unfortunately, you got a lot of black women out there who are screaming and shouting, yeah, these Negroes ain't no good, we don't need them, they dead beat dads. But you got a lot of other black women who are saying no. We do have some black men like that. Oh, yes, we do, who voluntarily choose not to be men. But the more educated sisters, like the ones in these rooms, they're going to say, yes, my brother might have some issues. But that's a conversation I'm going to have with him away from white people, because white people ain't got no business in no conversation between black men and black women. But while you are here, white people, let's talk about how you systematically created the problem that black men are in. Let's go back in America 50 yes. years ago. Who were the drug dealers? Who was running the guns? Who was selling the liquor? It was Jews, Irish, and Italians. Poor, broke, destitute white folks. They did the same thing black men are doing today. The only difference was, in the 1940s, America upgraded Jews, Irish, and Italians to white people. They were not considered white till 1940. Do your history. 
They were not considered white. When they made them white, they gave the Italians the fire departments in America, they gave the Irish the police departments in America, and they gave the Jews the civil service jobs that they still dominate in places like Chicago and Philadelphia. In other words, the government gave them an economic stimulus package. All we're doing is the crime they used to do. Bugsy Seagull, Meyer Lansky, Al Capone, these were not black men. They were white criminals, not born to commit crime, but who had to turn to crime because there was no opportunity given. Criminals are not born. Criminals are made, you see. And that's why for me, black men have to form their own movement, separate from my sisters, to look out for each other's best interests. Because nobody's going to save black men but black men. But the problem we have amongst us is ego. See, there can be no Negro without the ego. And as y'all work as black men, you have to be able to supplant the ego for the greater good of the movement. Because the biggest problem that's suffocating black consciousness in America now is ego. Everybody wants to be the leader, but nobody's doing no work. You understand? Mm -hmm. So we have to be able to put that to the side because guess what? Not all white folks get along. Jews don't like Irish, Irish don't like Italians, Italians don't like Anglo-Saxons. Yeah. But when it comes to looking out for the best interests of white folks, they can put all that to the side and struggle together. North sure. Koreans don't like South Korea, South Koreans don't like Japanese, Japanese don't like Cambodians, Cambodians don't like Chinese. But when it comes to the greater good of Asian people, they can put the ego to the side, work together. We're the only people on the planet who cannot stop internal petty fighting long enough to deal with our greater enemy. And that's why we dead last. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, questions? Um, so like, us as social justice fellows, and I know you mentioned like kind of self-interest, um, we had like attended a training and whatnot, and it was talking about like, the basis of the training was to like figure out how to like affect change, right, on the like political or local level. Um, and like, I guess like the, I guess like the question was like, um, like, I noticed, like, in some of your interviews, like, you would say, like, um, like, I guess multiculturalism or, like, having others, like, in the Multiculturalism movement. is a trick yes, to get you to identify with other non-white people mm -hmm. long enough for them to steal everything they worked for these past 400 years and turn it back on you. The Jews did it with the NAACP, okay? A hundred years ago, there was a Jewish black movement. Jews don't even talk to black folks today. They used us, Okay behind the banner of the NAACP, the in the Urban League, and the other social justice movements. And the minute we got those rights, they took them and ran. Latinos are doing the same thing today, even though they black racially too, but they don't want to be, okay? But it's the same thing. We have no friends. But every time you go somewhere, the first thing they say is, we got to get some Latinos in. We got to get the uh, white folks in. They're going to use you and throw you away. Remember this rule. A disorganized people has no business uniting with the more organized people because you will be used and exploited. Until we are thoroughly organized ourselves, we have no business organizing with another group. You will be taken over. Do y'all follow where I'm coming from? Yeah. It's like gangs in the city. Y'all got a little gang. It's five of y'all. He got a gang that's 50 years old and 50,000 folks. What's going to happen to your gang five years after messing with them? It's gonna you ain't going to even exist no more because you're, right. you're too weak. Yeah. Power has to meet power at its same level. If you ain't got that same power, you ain't got no business working with them because they're going to use you and throw you away. And everybody been using black folks as a political football for the past 200 years. Yeah. They don't care nothing about us. Where was the Chinese when the water hose was being set on us? Where was the gays when they were dogs was biting their breasts off black women? Where was the Arabs and the East Indians when we was out there protesting? They was nowhere to be found. In fact, the Chinese and Latinos fought in court for the right not to be included with us. They wanted to be called white. Yes. Do your research. The Chinese went to court and fought to be called white. The Latinos went to court and fought to be called white, but they lost the fight. Oh, yes. Nobody wanted to be associated with black folks then, and they don't want to be associated with black folks now. Everybody wants to be black when it's time to listen to the rap. Everybody wants to be black when the past is sagging. Everybody wants to be black when they put something in their lips to make them bigger. Everybody wants to be black to get a bigger butt. Everybody wants to be black to go to the Grammys and the Oscars and the BET Awards. But nobody wants to be black when white cops start shooting us down. I a little bit, but we got somebody even in our school. It's interesting, like how they try to like affiliate with our organization, and it's like what organization? Um, with like the social justice fellowship. Well, what's the like, other group you're speaking of? Um, uh, it's, it's well, what type of student? It's a Hispanic American. Well, see, here's the thing: with Hispanics, you have to take them 
First of all, there's no such thing as Hispanic. Yes, That's indeed. the word the United States yes, government indeed. created. Mm -hmm. And the reason they created the word Hispanic because Latino African, Afro-Latinos were coming to America and calling themselves white. Mm -hmm. And the government said, y'all can't do that. And they said, well, we don't want to be black. And the government said, but you are. Your ancestors came from Africa just like them. Y'all speak Spanish, they speak English, it's all slave master tongue. But they said, we don't want to be associated with the blacks. So the government said, here's what we're going to do, because you ain't white and you cannot call yourself that. We're going to give you a new title, and that's where the word Hispanic come from. Mm -hmm. It's a government label. It is not culture or anything else. The white man made it up. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to Afro-Latinos, you have to deal with them the same way you deal with other Africans based on their identity. Mm -hmm. If a Puerto Rican walks in that door and says, listen, I'm African, my grandmom is black, She's back home in Puerto Rico or Cuba. And by the way, my great-grandfather's from Cuba, okay? Yes, sir. I'm going to say, brother, come have a seat, because you just told me you identify with me. Yes, sir. That ain't the end of the story. I'm going to still check you to make sure you really rep what you're saying. Yes, as far as I know, you could be a plant being sent to me. Mm -hmm. You understand? But if another Puerto Rican walk in there and say, I'm not black, I'm Puerto Rican, well, Puerto Rican is not a race. So what is your race? Right. I'm Puerto Rican. That's not a race. That's a nationality. Mm -hmm. What is your race? Yes, Biological origin. What is it? I'm Spanish. Okay, take your Spanish ass on out of here. In other words, if a Latino identifies with being African, I'm going to treat them no different than I treat you. If a Latino does not identify with being African, I'm going to treat him the same way I would treat Clarence Thomas, who's a full-blooded, blue-black, purple, nappy-headed black man who identifies with white folks. You see, so for me, it's no difference. If you identify with white folks, I'm going to treat you the same way I treat them. It's not just identity. It's also consciousness and loyalty. loyalty. Not just color. If a black man is running for elected office, the fact that he's black don't mean a damn thing to me because we've been sold up by black folks for the past 300 years. Yeah. Are you consciously black? And are you committedly black? And are you consistently black? And are you courageously black? Yes, sir. It got to be all five. Yes, sir. And as y'all get older and y'all start looking for your husbands and your wives, you make sure you marry somebody who has your same level of consciousness because there's too many brothers and sisters out here who are social justice activists who are marrying coons. If you're trying to help your people, what the hell are you doing marrying a coon? But the problem with us as men, we'll look at the phenotype of the woman and say she's gorgeous and not evaluate that mindset. And black women to do the same thing. Y'all give it a brother because he's handsome. We'll look at his income. You got to evaluate his mindset because right now I've been dealing with a lot of families that are on the verge of divorce because the man married a coon or the queen married a coon. And they knew that they was coons when they married them, but they ignored it because they liked the paycheck or they liked how they look. Nah, you're going to be in this your whole life. Your life partner got to be somebody you can ride with to the day you die. Okay? I don't want you to be no serial divorcee with people four and five wives. I know somebody 40 years old, he's been married three times already. What the hell is going on? <laughs> Take your time. Choose them once. Choose them right. Mm -hmm. yes, and for the ladies, if you don't have children, don't have none until you marry. We got to kill the baby mama thing. We got to kill it. Kill it. No babies till you marry. If you got a baby, fine. Raise your seed. No more, though. Until you marry. Same thing with the fellas. You got a baby, take care of it, but no more. We got to stop that. We have to go back to restoring the respect and divinity of the traditional black family. Talk. <clears throat> I think we have time for one more question. I know that uh, President Smothers wanted to have a conversation. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. My question is just, is more so like, uh, what's your take on religion? Religion? Specifically. What is the role of religion? In the black community, the purpose of religion is to keep alpha males out of the black consciousness struggle. The purpose of religion is to make disorganized, politically devastated people think that they don't have to do anything about their condition because God is going to do it for them. Religion has hurt the black community almost as much as white supremacy itself. Not the beliefs. I want to be clear about this. It's not about believing in Jesus or Muhammad. That's irrelevant. It's the political lessons of the church. We love everybody. We're colorblind. God doesn't know race. When you raise a child to believe that his race, the family he was born, the human family he was born into has no relevance, it'll be hard to restore that later. You're raising a coon. So many of our ch children who are raised in a mosque and in the church are raised as coons. They are of no relevance whatsoever to the political struggle because their whole identity is wrapped up in religion. And to that, I say your race is 50 times more important than your religion. Religion doesn't even come close to your race. And why do I say that? You, born you chose religion. your religion. Yes, sir. God chose your race. Yes, 
You were made African by supreme consciousness. You could be a Muslim today. You could become a Catholic tomorrow, Christian the next day, seven day advantage, Jehovah witness. You could change, change, change. It's superficial. This is for life. God made me this. So nothing can come before this. This existed before Jesus was born. This existed before Muhammad, Moses, and Abraham. I'm older than any religion you can name. So if I don't see divinity in my own black skin, how can I find it anywhere else? I ain't got a problem with the church. I got a problem with certain pastors who exploit black people's hopelessness for financial gain. See, here's my issue with church. Black church collects too much money and gives us so little in return. You got churches out here who got an annual income, revenue, donation, ties, of a million dollars. No school, no bank, no supermarket, no hospital, no jobs, no factory, no industry, no pharmacy. How are you taking in that much money from poor black folks? And you ain't got a single institution to hire a single black boy. You got churches that deal in millions and ain't give nobody a job. That is a sin. It's an absolute sin. We have to rethink and recreate our religious institutions, because right now they're not set serving as well. You have some exceptions, but the exception does not negate the rule. Okay, um, so thank you for getting uh, protected from the Real, real talk. Yeah. Impart your wisdom on the students and us as well as staff. Um, y'all got chills. I do I'm going to throw something on y'all. I'm going to throw something on y'all to think about and with the brother too. Absolutely. One of the things I do at the college campuses, if y'all ever interested, is we can do a one-day men's conference Ooh, and a one-day women's conference, or you can combine them. If that's something y'all want to do, because I've done that for universities, other HBCUs. And we break it, we, 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 we go through the whole joint, the black history, we deal with the politics, we deal with career, we deal with entrepreneurship. It's like the six most important areas of life and consciousness, and we deal with it. Break for lunch, come back. Break for dinner, come back. Then we show a couple movies, and we talk about it. Okay, because I got a library that's pretty extensive with some documentaries, some stuff you want to see that you've not seen. I need that. That's a very intellectual, insurrectionary type of thing. So let me know if you ever want to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Yeah, we're going to get a picture. Oh, yes, sir. Where my black black learning matters uh, hoodie at? Y'all ain't got no two or three X's over there? (laughs) You only got some mediums? Extra some medium? (laughs) Some of them over there was big, though. (laughs) Extra large. He said some stuff, man. Oh, a short oh, sleeve. Oh, I'm like a rocket if it's a short sleeve. Oh, okay, good looking out. No problem, no problem. A short sleeve. I can mess with that in the book bag. If you're not woke, you sleep. So everybody that's smooth. Marco got a snowstorm in. Chill, bro. This is me. <laughs> Back, obviously, ladies in the front. Uh, oh, what if we want to be in the back? Go ahead. This is the screen. Don't get all that dinner with none of y'all. I've been trying to buy one of these forever. Let's not want to buy one. I want to buy one. Oh, yeah, he said, come on. Yeah, let's come out there. A little bit more room. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no problem. No problem, bro. It's cold. Yeah, it's, it feels better already. Yeah. Got you. Got you. Photographer. Okay. I might have something for you. Let's get it. Gotta get you in the middle for sure. Let me go on the left side. Let's move this. Come over here. <laughs> in fact, y'all go ahead and bunch up. I'm gonna kind of scoop right there. Appreciate it. You want a chair? Nah. And you take this. Okay. Okay. Ladies, y'all kind of. Oh, yeah, the ladies yeah, probably yeah. should be. Yeah. You want to pick? No, it's on the line. Terry, what's with Make sure the ladies. No, is... I don't. Yeah, right? Mm-hmm. It's a nice oh, it's just. Three, two. Nope. Let me yeah. snap one more for the, for the lead. All right, three, two, one. Don't move, y'all. Let me get one on mine. <laughs> Got to keep a couple memories. Because once I open this school, ain't going to be too much more travels. I'm going to have to be local. Make sure nobody shoot the school out. <laughs> Rest in peace to the Florida kids. Mm. Hold on. All right, three, two.
got a couple of them for you. All right. All right. There you go. So y'all will be at the lecture, right? Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. And, and make sure y'all tell your peers. Right. Stay in touch with me. I got the number. Got the number. Sure. All right. That's what you need. That three five. You're right. Uh, Justin got Justin got all the pictures. Man, he just dropped some gems on this boy. All right, y'all. Signing out. I'm gonna be back on later. So come back on later if you all want to catch the uh, bless the mic. Peace.